Hey, if you're, a, if you're a guest here this morning, first time, second time, we're uh, super excited that you're here to worship with us. Uh, as a church, it's our vision to connect people to Jesus and love our community. And part of loving our community, we have a couple things coming up in the next several weeks that I really want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, not second announcement time, but you heard earlier the game feed is this Saturday. Uh, really would love for you to attend. Uh, if you have questions, find someone in camo today and they can answer them for you. Uh, the second thing uh, we talked about last Sunday in the middle of our sermon uh, is... Love Our Community Sunday, which is April 14th, uh, where we're all going to meet here together as a church, uh, and then we're going to go out and serve in our community. Uh, we're going to go be the church in our community on Sunday morning and have a ton of fun together. Uh, and so a couple things I've been asked, and I just want to clarify about that day, uh, is the number one thing I've been asked is, how do I sign up? Which is great. I'm glad you want to be a part of it. Ne- starting next Sunday, uh, we will have sign-up sheets available for all the different projects that we're doing. And you can sign up where you want to serve, where you want to be a part of. Um, and, and so want to make that clear as far as what's going on. I've also been asked, uh, hey, I'm not sure that I can get a around to serve. We have projects of just sitting uh, and not doing, you'll be doing something, but not heavy activity, things like that. So we want to catch everybody that's a part of our church, young and old, uh, all different abilities, uh, and we're going to serve together. So I want to let you know about those two things. Uh, Today, we're kicking off a new series called Traders. And uh, in thinking about this series past several months, uh, the idea is that we all have something that we need to give up. Right? We all have something in our lives that we need to let go of. There's something that uh, maybe we're harboring. There's something that uh, is just taking, maybe it's bitterness. Uh, maybe we're not forgiving in an area where maybe we should, and that's taking a lot of work. And uh, We all have something that we need to let go of. For some of us, it's an addiction. Maybe some of us know about it, and maybe others of us, it's secret. Maybe it's just a habit. Maybe it's just a, a focus on self. We all have something. We all have something that we need to let go of. And when you look throughout the Bible, there are different exchanges that take place, different trades that people make. And over the next several weeks, we're going to look at some of these trades where someone hands someone or hands off something and they receive something. And some of them are positive. Some of them are good trades. Others of them, others of them are not so good. But as we look at these different examples throughout the history of God's word, where human beings like you and I, where there is an exchange, there's a trade that takes place, God always works out of it, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And my prayer is over the next several weeks as we lead into Easter, that God will work through some trades that we need to make, some things that we need to offload in life in order to grab hold of a closer relationship with him. I want to pray, and we're going to jump in. God, I'm thankful this morning to be here with a group of people that none of us are perfect, and none of us have it figured out. But God, we are here to learn from you and to learn to trust in you who does. Father, I pray this morning that you will teach us. I pray that your spirit is loud. God, I pray that you will silence ourselves so we can hear you. Jesus, I pray this morning that uh, no matter what we drug into the room, God, you will help us to let go of it. Uh, Father, if, if we have been holding on to ourself and have not been willing to turn it over to you, I pray that over the next several weeks, God, you will work in us and challenge us. Give us a desire to trade our life for life in you. Jesus, we're thankful that because of a cross, we have that opportunity. We have an opportunity for a second chance and to come to you. Father, help us to not miss that chance. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So I mentioned several weeks ago that I was a baseball uh, card collector. Actually, at the end of last year. That was more than a couple weeks. Uh, But at the end of last year, in a sermon, I mentioned that I collected baseball cards. And I have big notebooks and boxes and all of this stuff in my garage. And and so I decided that I I would pull one of them out and just look through it. I have not done this in a long time. uh, But I started flipping through, and all of a sudden, like, all of this nostalgia just started coming up. Like, I remember sitting in my living room and trading cards with friends, and I remember collecting these. And I, I also realized that at one point in my life, I was very organized. 
someplace between baseball cards and adulthood. It got dropped. I'm not sure. Uh, but these are all in like alphabetical order and they have protector sleeves and all of this other stuff. I don't know what happened. Okay. I dumped it all into baseball. Uh, but anyway, and, and so I started looking at it and all of, the, all of a sudden all these memories started coming up. And I remember uh, sitting in our living room a lot of days after school. If it was raining, we couldn't go outside. Uh, and I would sit there with some of my friends, and we would, we would trade cards. And so, you know, say, I really want that card. Uh, what will it take to get it? And then, you know, they'd name a price. Like, I don't know. Or, you know, yeah, sure. And, and so I started thinking, is there ever a trade I wish I had made? So I kind of started rolling through my head as I was flipping through the pages. And not a baseball card, but I remember one day after school where – I had the opportunity uh, to trade for a Shaquille O'Neal rookie card. Yeah, right, right, yeah, ooh. This monstrosity of a human that uh, played in the NBA, uh, his rookie card, okay, rookie, first-year card, uh, not many of them, probably worth a lot of money now, okay, hence the sigh or groan. Uh, I had the opportunity to get a Shaquille O'Neal rookie card. And the card that he wanted in exchange was one of my favorite players, and so I said no. And he tried to talk me into it. Now, was my favorite player, was his card, was it a rookie card? Nope. Was my favorite player any good? No. <laughs> if I would have made the trade, would I have been stealing a card practically from him? Yes. But did I make the trade? No. I didn't. Even though there was so much value in the Shaquille O'Neal rookie card because I liked the name that was on the front of the card that I had of my favorite player, I didn't do it. I missed out on the value of that card because I liked the name that was on my card. And not when it comes to necessarily baseball cards or anything like that, but in life we do this same thing. There are a lot of times in our lives we miss out on the value of the relationship that God wants from us because we like a name. You know whose name it is? Ours. We miss out on the value and the richness and the depth of a relationship that God is calling us to to do incredible kingdom things, whether it's right here in our own backyard or someplace else, and we miss it because we like the name on our card. We like to be in control. And we don't want to make that trade because it means that we lose our name. Even though we might gain something of great richness and value, we miss it. Because we like our name and we like things our way and we like to be in control. This morning, though, we're going to take a moment and look at a man who was willing to make this trade. We can't necessarily know what to do unless we sometimes see an example of it. So this morning we're going to look at an example. A man who was willing to give up his name in order to be found in the faithfulness of God. If you brought a Bible, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. It will also be on the screen. You're also welcome to look it up on your phone. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, we're going to... Uh, read together a story that many of us have heard uh, maybe over and over and over again. Maybe our kids have played with toys that have to do with Noah's Ark. You see, because Noah, as many times as it's repeated and colored in our kids' ministry, there is a depth of Noah's story that oftentimes we miss. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to be re begin reading together in verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted, had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, <coughs> I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy them and the earth. So go, make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. And then he gives the description of how he's going to build it. I'm going to pause right there. Friends, we're in Genesis 6. Six chapters after creation. You know what my first thought is? We're not off to a good start. 
right? <laughs> like, you read that, like, I'm going to get rid of everything on earth and all the people. We are definitely not on the right foot at this point. It, this, is, this is the corruption of the world already. Already, in six chapters of the Bible, the world has already corrupted itself to the point that God is so upset that he said, you know what, we almost need to do a do-over. We almost need to wipe this slate clean and start afresh. And so he finds the one man in society, one man in culture. And you see how Noah, how Noah is labeled? He's righteous, he's blameless, and he walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? It means that we build our lives off of the foundation of who he is. But not just build our lives, we, we obey. But here's the difference. Now, obedience can be done in two ways. Obedience can be done with I'm obeying and grumbling. Like when you tell one of your kids to go clean their room and they do it, but they roll their eyes at you the whole way. Like they are obeying, but they're grumbling the whole time that they do it. But then there's obedience with joy. Now I've yet to experience tell my kid to go clean their room and they're joyous about it, but when, when we choose to obey and are joyous about it, we, we find joy in obeying God. We find joy. We find joy in living the life that God calls us to live. To where there is this joyful obedience of walking with God. Question. Right out of the gate. Do we walk with God? Do we joyfully obey and build our lives off the foundation of who he is and our relationship with him? Do we walk with God or do we just walk into a church building that talks about God? Do we live, do we live in such a way that our lives are a witness of the power of God? Or we just, do we just hope that the power of God makes us feel better? Noah was a man that amidst all of the corruption, it was easy to see that he walked with God. If we were to bring an outsider in that didn't know you or even our community, would they be able to pick you out as a person who walks with God? Would there be something in our lives that stands out that, they, that says they follow something different? This is how we learn of Noah. And then God looks at Noah after he gives the condition and the corruption of the world. And he says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. And now if someone came up to you and said, I need you to build a boat. My first thought is, I don't know how to build a boat. Okay? That's my first thought. But I would also have the understanding of they want, they want to use this boat. There is water close by, Right? Yeah, you could take this boat that we make out to Long Branch and, you know, you could take it around like it would work. When God tells Noah to build a boat, it is very likely that they have not seen rain. And what is true is that where Noah's at, it's more than 100 miles to any water source that would be big enough for a boat. Let alone a boat that's more than a football field long. No, I want you to build a boat. You what? I want you to build an ark. And this is the type of wood and then this is how you're going to build it. And by the way, by the way, when you build this boat, it's going to be longer than a football field and it's going to stand four stories tall. Oh, do you want me to do this tonight or tomorrow, you know? <laughs> no, I want you to build a boat. And Noah's faced with a choice. Does Noah obey joyfully? Or does Noah follow the voice of the crowd. Does Noah follow the voice of the crowd or does Noah obey? You see, for Noah, for him to obey in this moment, to take this step in his faith, he trades his livelihood, he trades his name in society, he trades the perception of who he is. Because in a wicked and corrupt culture, if all of a sudden, more than 100 miles from any large water source, you start building a boat, and then you tell people, God told me so, what is culture saying about you? You're nuts. You're crazy. And those are the words we can say in church, right? Like, if you're building a boat, 
where they maybe have never seen rain and you're this far from water. I mean, it is ridicule. It is slander. It is the worst comments. They're standing in your front lawn and they are shouting these as you just continue to work. Noah built a boat. You see, the voice of the crowd is loud. And the voice of God is straight and narrow. Does Noah put all of these things on the trading block in order to be faithful? And for some of us, God, God is asking, I need, I need you to bring yourself to the trading block. Because I need your faithfulness. Noah begins to work. He begins to work. Noah chooses faithfulness when the culture chooses selfishness. Our truth this morning says the crisis for faithfulness trumped the cackle of the crowd. As the crowd begins to chirp and the crowd begins to make comments and the crowd begins to roar of all of the ridiculousness of what Noah is doing, building this boat in the middle of nowhere when there is no understanding exactly of why it is happening. The crowd and culture, they begin to make themselves loud. But Noah chooses faithfulness. We learn a little bit more about Noah in this process in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It says, but by faith, by faith, Noah, when warned against the things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping the faith. Not yet seen. Again, we're reminded, Noah has no idea how this is going to play out. He doesn't know why he's building the boat. God just said, build a boat. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe this slate clean. But then did you notice what his faith did that we learned in Hebrews? His faith saved his family. Guys in the room, I, I want to talk to you just for a minute. By Noah's faith, his whole family was saved. By Noah's faith, his whole family found life afterwards. Because of Noah's faith, because he took leadership and responsibility in his family, even when there was not answers and even when it seemed like things were a little bit nuts, his faith was what stood the strongest. It was his holy fear of God that saved his family. Guys, our faith, our faith should be pursuing God continually. Guys, it is our job to live with a faith that leads our family well. It's our responsibility to cultivate a faith, not where our wife drags us to church and we grumble the whole way. We don't send our families to church. We lead our families. We lead our families with a faith that saves them. So when struggles come in your family in years to come, there is a faith that is built upon that stems from you. Build a faith that saves your family. By Noah's faith, his faithfulness. By his faithfulness, he traded the credentials of culture for faithfulness to God. For all of us, God very well might not be asking you to build a boat because it's going to wipe out mankind. And if he is, let me know. Uh, <laughs> I'll jump in and help. He's probably not asking you to build a boat. But he, I, what I know he is asking you for is he is asking all of us to build a life that gives credit to him. He's asking us to build a life that shows off his might. He's asking us to build a life that communicates his grace to the people around us. He's asking us to build a life that displays the humility of the cross. I don't want to paint just this beautiful picture that if we're faithful, everything works out. Because honestly, the closer we get with God, the weirder we're going to seem in a post-Christian culture. 
Like the more that we begin to obey and the more that we choose to obey with joy in a world that just completely wants to walk away from the truth of God, we are going to seem weird. And at some point, faithfulness has to trump blending in with the world. At some point, us being faithful means that we are going to look different. Noah certainly did not blend in. As he's pulling the door up on the ark. Noah, he didn't blend in and all, as all of a sudden there's two lions walking through his front yard and up this ramp into the bow. He didn't blend in. There are some times that when we choose faithfulness over the cackle of the crowd, we're going to look weird. But when we trade in our name for the faithfulness of God, it always works out. Paul reminds the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed, which, which means make an exchange for something new. Offer ourselves as this sacrifice. Offer ourselves on the table and say, God, I bring myself to trade in. Need a little bit of an upgrade. I need an upgrade that leads to heaven. I need an upgrade of hope. You see, friends, the hard part of Christianity is that God is not calling us to the attractiveness of culture, but to the alternative in Christ. He's not calling us to blend in. There's times when we will not. And when God calls us to trade ourselves for faithfulness, he doesn't always tell us how it's going to work out. No, I need you to build a boat. You don't know why. You don't know when. I just need you to build a boat. And as you work in your faithfulness, I will begin to show you how I am faithful. Build a boat. For you and I, God, he might not be calling us to build a specific boat, but he's calling us to build a life. That chooses him over the crowd and culture, over the cackle and the voices that say, you know what, let's walk away. Build a boat. Build a boat so when the rains come, your family will be faithful and safe. Build a boat. Build a boat so when the diagnosis of cancer comes in, you don't sink. Build a boat. Build a boat so when depression and anxiety creep in and you're not sure where to turn, you still stay afloat. Build a boat. Build a boat so when your kids are grown and all of a sudden decide that church might not have as much value, you don't walk away as well. Build a boat. Build a boat that when you're tired and you're weary by the busyness of life, there's faith to still stand on, build a boat. We live, friends, in a day and age when there is a crisis for faithfulness. This morning, will you choose the faithfulness of God over the cackle of the crowd and culture? We choose to walk with God even when it might seem weird and to trade the priorities of this world to the, for the person of Jesus. I mentioned earlier a trade that I wish I had made. But have you ever made a bad trade? Like, have you ever made a choice, say, oh, I wish I could go back and do that over? I wish I could say that differently. Or I wish my filter would have kicked in and I would have said nothing, right? I wish I wouldn't have bought that used car that someone, you know, drove into a wall and then put it back together and sold it like it was good. I wish I wouldn't have made that. I wish I, wish I would not have traded my purity 
for that high school sweetheart that walked away a couple weeks later and left me feeling empty. I, I wish I wouldn't have made that trade. I wish I wouldn't have, I wish I wouldn't have traded myself that night in college. I wish I wouldn't have made that trade. I, I wish I would not have traded all of those days of worry that were about nothing, that ended up being nothing, and I lost a lot of life because of it. I, I wish I wouldn't have made that trade. I, now that I'm grown and my kids are out of the house, I, I wish I would not have traded all of the time I could have been with them for more hours at work. I wish I wouldn't have made that trade. My guess is that every one of us in the room has a trade we wish we could do over. I wish I wouldn't have gotten so upset at my kids when they were little and tearing apart my house. I wish I wouldn't have said that to my spouse. I wish I could trade that moment. I wish I could trade the moment when I traded my spouse for selfishness. I wish I could do that over. Do you have a trade that you wish you could do over? I made a card trade when I was in elementary school. I was in fourth grade. The guy I traded with, he was in fifth grade, and I made this trade, and I thought that I was getting the better end of the deal, and I told my friends about it. And they informed me that I was far from right. And they said, you did what? You gave up what, and you got what in return? And I began to explain to them, you know, what it looked like. And they said, you have to do that over. Like, you gave up something that was rare and valuable. You just gave it away for nothing. And so I went to the kid after school, and he was in fifth grade. He was a bigger kid than me. His name was Nick. And I said, hey, man, I said, we got to make this right. Hey, the card that I gave you and that, we just need to go back and do it over again. And he looked back at me. He's like, no way. I said, trade's a trade. You got to live with it. And I was immediately furious. And there was absolutely nothing that I could have done because he was huge and I was not. And I was like, no, really. I said, I, I, I need to go back and do this over again. It, it just, it wasn't right. I shouldn't have done it. And he said, no. A trade's a trade and you just got to live with it. It's final. Now, I've not lost much sleep over that trade in fourth grade. I still remember it. But there are a lot of us in the room today that we have made trades where we have either let go of our faithfulness for the voice of the world or we have just chosen the voice in the world over and over and over again instead of the faithfulness of God. And unlike a silly fourth grade card trade, we don't have to live day in and day out with that defining us. Yeah, there might be some consequences of it, and yeah, there might be some scars from it, but there are some of us that we walk around day in and day out and we think because I made this choice, this is who I am for the rest of life. Because I made this choice 40 years ago, and this is still who I am today. Because I made this choice at work, this is still what I have to do. Because I made this mistake in my finances one time, well then I'm just sunk forever. And we walk around and we think I'm defined by this one moment where I made a bad choice and I traded my name for what I wanted. And Jesus steps in and he steps up to a cross and he says, I take your bad trade. And I love you. And you are no longer that moment. And you are no longer that trade. And you are not designed as my child to carry it around and drag it around anymore. You see, when we made the bad trade, the wages of that trade was death. But because of a cross that Jesus went to and because of an empty grave, the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus did not design us, and he does not define us by our bad traits. He defines us by what he traded for us. And he picks us up, and he says, you are so much more than your worst moment. You are so much more than your bad trait. Choose faithfulness, because I will always be faithful to you. The rains came. The ark moved. Everything was wiped out. But there was still life. 
and in our lives this morning. Maybe the rain's coming right now. And you're not sure you're going to sink or swim. Maybe you don't know right now why you're being faithful. But God just says, keep being faithful. Maybe right now things are pretty flooded. And you're not sure that you can keep swimming. God says, choose faithfulness. When the crowd says to give up. Because the alternative in Christ is always better than the crowd that's around. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to worship and sing together. There's some of us this morning that we know that we've been holding on to our name. We have yet to choose the name of Jesus. We have yet to surrender ourselves. We've yet to get baptized. We've yet to say, I'm I'm about Jesus and not about my name. We've yet to make that trade. And if that's where you're at, I wouldn't go another day without that. Without the hope of heaven. There's some of us, though, we've made that choice. But over time, the voice of the crowd has become louder and louder and louder. And the voice to blend into culture has become louder and louder and louder. And we find ourselves choosing the voice of the crowd over the faithfulness of God more and more and more. And maybe as we worship this morning, it's God, I want to be faithful. I want to be weird sometimes. I want to be faithful. Because he showed me what faithfulness looks like. And the life that's found in you is always better than what I'm going to find around me. God, help me to be faithful. Help me to be faithful when the flood comes. God, help me to be faithful and build the boat when you ask. God, help me to choose faithfulness over the crowd. Because you chose the cross. You chose death for me. Let's worship together.